Amen. Well, welcome once again. Uh, we are at this time going to observe the ordinance of baptism. I believe it was two weeks ago we uh, had the Lord's Supper is the other ordinance. And today we're going to observe uh, the ordinance of baptism. And uh, baptism uh, doesn't save you as some churches teach, but it is an act of obedience after you are saved. And uh, uh, we know that Jesus Christ himself submitted himself to baptism. And it wasn't to become the Son of God, it was because He was the Son of God, and He did that before He started His earthly ministry. So sometimes we call it the first act of obedience, and uh, we know the Bible says that to obey is better than sacrifice. And so uh, today we have two candidates, a man and a wife, uh, Bill and Regina. We're going to have uh, them come down at this time, uh, husband and wife, Bill and Regina Tatum. And so uh, I'm going to baptize Bill first. And Regina, I'll have you stand over here. But Bill, you come on across here if you would. And so, uh, Bill would like to share just a few words of his testimony to the church this morning before he gets baptized. My words are I uh, declare to the church and the world that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Bill, do you know if you were to die today, you'd spend eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, Bill, uh, based on your profession of faith, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in likeness of his death, raised again in likeness of his resurrection. Regina, and she is. Uh, I'm already crying, so sorry. <laughs> she actually found our church on the on the website and read all about it. She wanted a church that uh, not only believes the Word of God, but it's based on the old King James Bible, and uh, so we're just glad they're here. So, do you know if you were to die today, Regina, you'd spend eternity with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Amen. Regina, based on your profession of faith, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised again. Praise the Lord, and welcome to HBF. Uh, my name's Brian. I'm one of the pastors here. It's exciting to come this morning and see folks all obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it's Mother's Day, so we got a lot of celebrating to do, and uh, we're thankful for all those that uh, are here today and enjoying that. We will have more in just a moment on Mother's Day as I'm going to bring a Mother's Day message. But before that, uh, one of the other things we're going to do is celebrate graduates. It's also that time of year, of course, where we have graduations, and, and uh, we don't have graduates without moms, right? So this is the fruit uh, of uh, labor of both mothers and fathers. We want to just take, a, take some time this morning and acknowledge our grads before uh, the Mother's Day message. So I would like to invite Luke. He's our, uh, our youth minister, and he is, uh, he's over our high school and junior high ministry. He's going to come and uh, just help us celebrate that. Thank you for coming. By the way, as Luke's coming, if you're a first-time guest to HBF, uh, I hope you got a guest bag. Is there anybody that's first-time guest? Just kind of raise your hand, or if you brought someone, raise your hand for them. They'll bring a guest bag as, as we get started here. And we are glad that you are here this morning to be with us. Uh, at the end of the service, we will have a time of offering. And uh, uh, if you could, inside of that guest bag, there's some gifts and what have you. There's also a white guest card. If you have opportunity, please fill that out and uh, drop that in the offering plate at the end of uh, the service, and that'd be a great gift to us. And then we'll get to know you, have a chance to reach out to you, and thank you for coming this morning. So thank you for being with us. I'll turn it over to Luke. Good morning. Uh, so yeah, every year, uh, sometime in the middle of May, you know, around graduation season, we we want to recognize the, uh, the seniors that have graduated high school or that are graduating this year. And uh, we do that for a couple of reasons. One is 
you know, we're, we're excited for them as a church body. You know, they are, they are uh, moving on to the next chapter, whatever that may be. Some go to college, some, you know, go off to work, some, some do whatever. But uh, so we want to recognize them and just the achievement that it is to finish, you know, high school and to, to get done with that chapter of their life. And uh, as Brian mentioned, it's Mother's Day. And uh, when I set this date several months ago, I didn't realize that it was going to be Mother's Day. And so we talked about changing it and we thought, you know, it's, we, you know, moms are a big reason why we make it through anything in life, right? Our graduation or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, moms are a really important, vital part of our lives. So we decided not to change it and, and kind of recognize seniors along with their, their moms and their dads. And so, uh, so we've got a couple of, of high school seniors that are graduating this year that are in our body. I'll have them come on up now. Uh, so I've got Olivia Bruner and Samuel Anderson. They're going to make their way up. Um, that's always the the fun part, whenever I ask if, you know, anybody wants to participate, uh, usually one of the first questions is, do we have to come on stage? And the answer is always yes, uh, but you only have to be up here for a minute, and you don't have to speak if you don't want to. So uh, we try and ease them in a little bit. But uh, so this is, this is Olivia Bruner and Samuel Anderson, and uh, so we've got a couple of pictures up here of them. Uh, so I, I always, we hand out like a questionnaire, and we kind of ask them what their plans are after high school, you know, where they're graduating from, what you know, what, what's going on? Does God, you know, you feel like God's calling you to anything specific now? And so, uh, so for Olivia, her, uh, her parents are Jason and Jessica, which was it just last year that Lily graduated? Okay. So this is two years in a row for them graduating someone out. So, uh, so Jason and, and Jessica Bruno are, are Olivia's parents. And, um, so she's graduating from Archie and, uh, this summer she's going to be taking a couple months or a couple of courses and, uh, enjoying, you know, the summertime and, uh, she's going to do some fun stuff that, uh, you know, you should do in the summer after you graduate. She's going to do some kayaking. Uh, she's going to try and earn some money. And then uh, at the end, or sometime this summer, you turn 18, right? Okay. Uh, she turns 18 this summer, so she's graduating at 17. Um, but she, she plans to become a therapist, so she's going to start that journey uh, this summer as well. And uh, as far as if God's calling her to anything specific, she feels like uh, God's calling to her inspire and guide individuals to learn from their mistakes, to see that life has purpose, and to give them hope through the Spirit of God in her so that they can be happy and have successful lives. So that's, as a Christian, that's what all of us ought to be doing, right? We ought to be uh, giving, you know, people the hope that lies within us. And so that's really cool that, that that's what she's desiring to do. And then uh, for Samuel, so he's the, the son of John and Don Anderson. Um, and many of you guys may probably don't know them, uh, but you may know Pam Anderson, which is his grandma. Uh, she's here. Yep, Pam. Uh, and so he's graduating from Harrisonville High School, and uh, this summer after high school, he plans to, to start working and earn some money, um, and also for him, he's doing something that all of us uh, ought to desire to do. He wants to enjoy the little things with the ones he loves the most and begin preparing for what lies ahead. Uh, I just like the way, you know, he wrote that down. It was cool to, to see that. Uh, all of us should be, you know, appreciating the little things and, and uh, spending time with the ones that we love. So uh, and then he's, he's unsure as far as what God's calling him to right now, uh, but he is, you know, praying and hoping that God will make that clear, as so many of us, you know, don't always know what we're doing after high school, but uh, he, he is open to whatever God has for him in the future. And so uh, we just want to, in addition to, you know, recognize them and, uh, you know, acknowledging that they are graduating and, and telling them they did a good job and, and all of that, uh, you know, we also want to make sure that uh, you guys have a face to, to some of these names. If, if you look at the prayer list that gets sent out each week, or if you're here on Wednesday nights and you guys go through the prayer list, um, there's a section on there, or even Sunday nights, there's a section for, you know, college students and, and things like that. And so a lot of times uh, it's easy to forget that, you know, we as a body need to be in prayer for those who are, you know, moving on to the next stage of their life. The, the time from your 18 to, you know, your mid-20s is a huge time of transition in our lives. And, and so we do want to be, uh, you know, put them in front of you guys so you know who they are, so you can be praying for them. And so, you know, if you see those names in the the prayer list, you know, we, we know who these people are. And so uh, just keep these guys in prayer. And, and, you know, as they try and figure out what, what God's going to have for them next, uh, you know, we want to be, be part of that and, and praying for them. So uh, give them a hand and thank you guys. Uh, um, we don't always uh, have college graduates. We don't always recognize college graduates uh, sometimes because they're, you know, gone off to college and and uh, they're not, you know, physically in the, in the body, but, um, 
But this year we have two college graduates also. Neither one of them is here this morning, so I'm not going to make them come up. But I do have uh, slides, and I want to you know, talk to you guys about who they are. So Travis Crawford, uh, that is uh, that's Wendy's um, old, that's now your oldest son, second oldest child, oldest son. Uh, so he graduated from University of Central Missouri. Both of these guys that graduated are, are uh, impressive to me as I was reading their their uh, degrees and their accolades. So uh, he graduated with a degree in aviation management with an emphasis in flight operations. Uh, he also got his pilot's license while he was at UCM. Uh, he's currently working just up the road here at the Walmart Distribution Center. Um, and he's been in the Army Reserves for the last four years, and he's working on switching to the Navy to become a pilot. Uh, so be in prayer for, for Travis as he's, again, it's that time of transition, that, that uh, time from high school to college or college to, you know, the real world, so to speak. And so uh, we just want to be, be remembering him and praying for him. And then uh, Benjamin Yoder, um, he graduated in December, so he graduated a little bit early um, this last semester. But he graduated from Southwest Baptist University. His degree is in biochemistry. And uh, he's working at Cox Health as a physician scribe. I don't even know what that is, but that's what he's doing. Uh, he's getting clinical experience for uh, getting ready to go to physician's assistant school. And uh, he actually got married. That picture is from his wedding. He got married uh, in March of this year. And so him and his wife were just here uh, last week. They're not here this morning. But, uh, and then I think Travis is out of town, right? Yeah, so um, anyway, so we just wanted to recognize. And uh, again, it's Mother's Day. I got, we got moms that are proud of these kids. And so, uh, you know, it's just an exciting time, exciting season of, of the year. And so just be remembering to pray for these guys and uh, just want to put their face in front of you guys and just recognize all of them publicly as, you know, having completed, uh, you know, a big task. And so just uh, thank you guys for the time. And Brian, I'll turn it back over to you. This spring... Only one hero can save her family and prevent disaster. Mom, we're going to be late for school. I don't think so. Whoa. Experience the phenomenon that critics are calling inspiring. Mom, I can't find number seven. Dig deep! A lot of fun. And pure genius. Mom, where's my phone? Table. Keys. Mudroom. Dragon Man. Under the couch between the monkey and the flip-flop. How does she do that? Created by God to demonstrate his love with grace, elegance, and poise. Have you seen my butane torch? Oh, that's good, mothers. We love you. We appreciate you. And uh, there's a lot of truth in all of that. Uh, I tell you what, without moms, where would we be? And where is the butane torch, by the way? So. If you have your Bibles, please be turned to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1 this morning. And uh, you moms are rock stars, and so we want to thank you for your labor and uh, the love that you have given, and appreciate you being here uh, this morning with us to celebrate Mother's Day. And uh, if, you're, if you're a mom, um, grandmother, a mother... Um, I told you to be turning, but if you could just stand for just a second. Don't lose your spot. Put your finger in the Bible um, and stand. Look at this, guys. And, man, we owe them some. Woo! Kelly Tally, that's you. Yeah, yeah. Give them some love. Appreciate you. All right, you may be seated. I want to just give you guys some honor. It's, it's, I love that we live in a country that... Uh, historically, anyway, as honored mothers. Now we're kind of losing our way on all of that. But this is the Church of the Living God. 
And, uh, and we know what the Bible teaches about honoring uh, mothers and fathers and honoring uh, those that are elders. And so we appreciate just living in a, in, a, in a country, at least being in a church where we recognize that and appreciate what God has given uh, as, a, as the fruit of the womb, of course, is the Lord's reward. And so, what a great day of celebration. We celebrated baptisms, man tatums, that was awesome, we enjoyed that. Uh, we celebrated graduates, and now we're celebrating mothers. And um, if you are looking for the, the, the text in First Samuel, by the way, you can turn to page 406 in one of those Bibles that's in the seat rack in front of you or near you, it should be one, or if you're a guest that's in the guest bag, we'll be on page 406. And Taylor wrote this poem, she says, who fed me from the gentle breast and hushed me in her arms to rest and on my cheek sweet kisses pressed my mother when sleep forsook my open eye who was it that sung sweet hush baby and rocked me that I should not cry my mother who sat and watched my infant head when sleeping in my cradle bed and tears of sweet affection shed my mother. When pain and sickness made me cry, who gazed upon my heavy eye and wept for fear that I should die? My mother. Who taught my infant lips to pray and love God's holy book and day and walk in wisdom's pleasant way? My mother. And can I ever cease to be affectionate and kind to thee who was so very kind to me? My mother. Ah, oh, no, the thought I cannot bear, and if God please my life to spare, I hope I shall reward thy care, my mother, who ran to help me when I fell, and would some pretty story tell, or kiss the place to make it well, my mother. When thou art feeble, old and gray, my healthy arm shall be thy stay, and I will soothe thy pains away, my mother. And when I see thee hang thy head, twill be my turn to watch thy bed, and te tears of sweet affection shed, my mother. And I read that poem. I thought, man, how beautiful it is to go from birth, uh, obviously, to uh, ultimately the aged time where we become the care caretakers of our parents. I think in this room, many of us uh, have gone through the different phases and understand the cycle of life and all that God brings. And when it comes to Mother's Day, uh, I hope for most, if not all of you today, that when you think about Mother's Day, you think about your mom, you do have uh, those types of affections, those types of things that are captured in that poem. Uh, I know I do, and I'm thankful for that. Mom, if you're watching, I'm thankful for you. Um, yet there's others on Mother's Day, and I recognize we live in a fallen world, and, and it brings up different emotions. It may be, bring up emotions of abandonment um, or hurt, um, maybe pain, uh, or even uh, pain of decisions made. And so this morning, I pray that God will just fill your hearts uh, if you need comfort, that he'll give you comfort. If you need uh, a peace, he'll give you peace. Uh, if you need encouragement, he'll give you that encouragement. But ultimately, I just pray that he gives you grace, grace to your hearts. As we consider a familiar character in the Bible, Hannah, many of you know who Hannah is. Some of you may not. I know there's some here that don't have any, um, you know, like you're coming today like I once came to church not knowing uh, anything about the Bible. And so we're going to talk about a character in the Bible from the Old Testament. Her name is Hannah. And she was a favored wife with a troubled life. I think in today's world, in Adam's, uh, in Adam's fallen race, in this world that we live in, I think there's a, a real reality to that. It, even a favored wife is going to have a troubled life because we live in a sin-wrecked world. And, and we're going to find encouragement this morning, I pray, in the text of 1 Samuel chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles on, on uh, page 406, uh, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, the Bible says, Now there was a certain man of Ramathium Zoepham of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroboam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, and Ephrathite. Well, those are some names. Verse 2, And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the other was Penaniah. And Penaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, 
For he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. And therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after that they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt uh, indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it shall come to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth, and Hannah, she spake in her heart. Now Hannah, I'm sorry, spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought that she had been drunken, and Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away the wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of thine abundance of, my, of complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. And Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house uh, to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to uh, pass, when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the men Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord uh, the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until, the, until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her uh, with three bullocks and one ephah flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And she slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the Lord Jesus and thankful for how you gave your son so that we could be saved. We're thankful for this incredible real story, Lord. It's a historical uh, story. I believe it's absolutely true that Hannah endured all of these things and by faith, Lord, persevered as she gave her, her first begotten son uh, to the Lord and to Eli and to the priesthood there in Shiloh. Lord, we're so thankful for this story. And, and Lord, I pray this morning that you would encourage our hearts as we consider uh, the grace that was bestowed upon Hannah the giving grace that is given to all the moms, not just to give birth, but to give their life and rearing children. And Lord, what that means to the kingdom of God in a time that's very much like the time of judges. Lord, where there is no king in Israel and every man does that which is right in his own eyes. Lord, there are glimpses of glory, glimpses of grace, Heavenly Father, that just, uh, just stick out uh, on the backdrop of that dark time. And Lord, I thank you for moms who are just like that, Lord. They're, they're glimpses of grace, Lord. They're, they're giving and they're loving uh, because they love you first and because you loved us first. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you and praise you for this opportunity just to, to encourage moms this morning uh, to remember uh, that there's not one of us that would not be here without 
uh, the, the uh, sacrifice of the mother giving birth. And we're so thankful for those faithful mothers that have raised and nurtured children and Lord brought them up in the Lord. We pray God a blessing on the reading of the word this morning, the hearing of the word, and most importantly, the living of the word of God as your word flows through us and courses through our hearts and our souls. We ask a blessing on this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're already seated, so you don't have to be seated. So, so God led me to this passage this morning, not just because I was looking for a Mother's Day message that would be fitting. I was just actually going through uh, this section in my daily reading, and as I considered all that was going on in the time of Judges, uh, it was so refreshing to see uh, someone like Ruth, someone like Hannah, just pop off the page. And in a time uh, in history where Israel had no king and, and everyone was doing that which was right in their own eyes. God was, was finding uh, ways to, to, to remedy that and he did that by finding these faithful women that were really in obscurity uh, to bring forth what God needed uh, to bring that, that the promises that he had given to the nation of Israel. It's an incredible thing when you look at it and you see it. And, and when you put it in the context of, of what God created the, the woman to be, which is to bear uh, children. I mean, men can't do that. Uh, it's a special gift that's given to women and it's a blessing. Um, and it's a shame today. It's a shame that things are so con confused and confusing and perverse in our culture. But man, it's, isn't it nice just to get in the Bible uh, where it's clear, it's straight, it's clean, it's right? Uh, man, I'm so thankful for that uh, on Mother's Day this year. I've never uh, preached on this passage, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to do that this morning. Uh, the thing that is impossible to miss about Hannah is her giving heart. Uh, would to God that we could all learn, man, a woman, a child, elder, uh, to just have the giving heart that Hannah had. It's a reflection, of course, of the father who would one day give his son for our sin. She didn't give because of the abundance, but actually she gave out of desperation. It kind of reminds you of what Paul said about the, the uh, churches of Macedonia in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, right? They didn't give out of affluence. They gave really, out, he didn't know where they gave from, right? They gave out of grace. God provided above what he could have even asked or hoped, by his grace. And by God's grace, I pray that's the way our life is, that God would do supernatural things through us, right? It's not because of our own strength, our own power. It's because of God. No one, when you think about the process of being a mother, there's really not a lot that can be done other than God has to bless it. I mean, you can do all the mechanics, but at the end of the day, what happens in the womb is, is a miracle. God is the one who brings life and, and he's the one who, where conception begins with him, right? The fruit of the womb is the Lord's. And we read in the text, and when he shuts up the womb, you can't open it. I mean, God is really the one that controls that. And so, um, I, and, I, and I can actually, Amy and I got testimony of that. I mean, that's absolutely the, the, the truth. He either opens it or shuts it. It is all in God's hands. And so, truly, it is a miraculous thing. And so... Uh, she didn't give because of abundance. She gave really out of desperation and dependence upon the Lord. So your first point of study this morning, and by the way, if you, if you didn't get a handout, I just need to share that. Raise your hand in the air and the, and the ushers will be around. And some of you are really into those. If you're not, don't worry about it, but they'll be coming around with those. I, I should have done that a moment ago. Forgive me. Um, this will be easy to follow this morning. It'll be quick and easy. I won't promise that, but I, I will say I'm, gonna, I'm striving for that. But Hannah, she gave her life as a wife to Elkanah. The first thing that we see in those first three verses when we look uh, at the text is that obviously she was a wife to, El to Elkanah. But wedlock had not, uh, not, not worked out as, as planned, uh, I'm sure. You know, we know from 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 5 that, that Elkanah favored Hannah. So she was the favored wife. Um, but it seems that, that even though he loved her, um, for whatever reason, you know, he didn't love her enough to wait on the Lord to open her womb. Now, we don't know why. I want to be fair to Elkanah. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, God did not encourage polygamy, but there was provision. And he, and he allowed it as long as the husband provided. If, if you're familiar with the story of Ruth, for instance, I mean, she was brought in and grafted in through the law of the kinsman redeemer. This could have, his uh, Penina could have been a wife from uh, a relative that he took on out of some sort of situation uh, where she was, her husband died and he was raising up children to, in his brother's name. We don't know. We don't know. None of those circumstances are given. It could be that, that Hannah was, was barren, as she obviously was barren. 
And Elkanah was like, man, I've got to raise up seed uh, in my name, which was very important in the Old Testament because like we reproduce spiritually, they reproduce physically, and it was, it was imperative. And, that, and, and so uh, that may have been the situation where he's like, man, I, I've got to do something here. And, and he takes on El, El, or Penina as his wife. And we don't really know. I don't know. You don't know. God knows. We're not given all that information. There's a lot of scenarios. But nonetheless, I think most of you women could understand, and, and, and most men, if you study the Bible, by the way, uh, when it comes down, right down to it, once you take on more than one wife, it's more than most men can handle. I promise you that. <laughs> right? You just can go through example after example, and, and there's not a man that took on a wife, more than one wife that doesn't struggle. Uh, in the Bible. There's jealousy, there's emulation, if not between the wives with the children. Um, it's a lot like a blended family. And a lot of you can un- identify with that. But all under the same roof. I mean, that would be tough. And it is tough. It's recorded as being tough. I'm not going to get into all of that. But we see in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 2 that he had two wives. So it wasn't like... Uh, it wasn't like God overlooked that. He knew that and, that, and and actually he had opened the womb. I said God opened the womb. He had opened the womb of Penina, right? She had not just one child, she had several children. And so, um, by the way, it was. I just want to throw a shout out because today, since everyone's doing that, which is right in their own eyes, um, God never intended us to have more than one wife. Polygamy was not uh, something that God was planning. He was always planning a one man with one uh, with one husband. And Lamech is the first person we find in the Old Testament, Genesis 4, 19 through 24, who happens to also uh, confess to his wives, first time you see multiple wives, that he murdered a young man. And he's like, man, I am, in, I am fearful for my life because if, if God uh, did that to Cain, what's he going to do to me? And that's all we know about that story. But he's also a murderer like his, his uh, great-great-grandfather Cain. His name was Lamech. Uh, different from the other Lamech that's in the Adamic line. Um, but uh, at any rate, well, they're both in the Edemic line, I should say. In Seth's line, uh, there's another Lamech. So there are two different Lamechs. Uh, so that was never what God intended. But God didn't forbid multiple wives as it was necessary for the care of women and the multiplication of families, as I've already discussed. Uh, so the Holy Ghost calls Penina, Penina Hananiah's adversary, as we read in verse 6. This was not a good relationship between her and and, and his other wife, Penina. So they were in an adversarial situation, it says in verse 6. Uh, and what a, what a difficult situation. She may have been the favored wife, but she had a troubled, wife, uh, a, a troubled life. And I would surmise that Hannah was most likely uh, the wife of Elkanah's youth. I don't know that, but I suspect that. Probably the first love, so to speak. Yet she couldn't bear seed. And uh, why he and how he married Penina, we don't exactly know, but I'm certain that bearing seed was a big part of that. You know, many of us in this room could understand the dynamics, as I mentioned, of a blended family. Statistically, uh, in, in 2019, which is the most recent statistics I could find, 3.9 million children in the USA lived in blended family arrangements. Uh, 7% of the children live in a blended family, which is lower uh, than I would have imagined, just 7% of the population. So I was like, okay, that's not as many as I actually thought, but I suspected that is because the latest statistics from 2019 shows that the USA is leading the world in children living with single parents. There's not as many blended families because, well, there's a lot more single parents. There's 23% in 2019 of the children in the United States right now only have one parent. And I would, I would suspect, and I didn't look up the statistics, I would suspect that most of those are probably single mothers, right? Raising their children uh, in that situation. That's a difficult life. So if I just took 20, I mean 25%, I could just like chop off a pretty good section of this congregation. And that would be single moms raising their children. Uh, 7% would be a lot smaller section of blended families. I, I totally was shocked by that, personally. I thought there'd be more blended families statistically. But really, the, the issue is single parenthood. Men are stepping out, and when the man steps out, who's left to step up? The moms. Typically. Okay, typically. There's also moms that step out, and the husbands step up. So I'm not just, I'm not, you know, God bless the parent who steps up, right? But right now we're talking about 
uh, Mother's Day, and we're talking about Hannah, and we're talking about statistically what's going on. So just for comparison, um, in other nations of the world, like the other leading nation would be Canada to our north, 15% of their population of their children are being raised by single parents. And then after that, it drops significantly. If you want to just look at one of the lowest uh, places in the world, uh, which most of them are on average, and you know, four or five percent, China's at three percent. So their parents, even though of course they got the one child policy, or they did have, they've abandoned that now, but uh, they used to have the one child policy until a few years ago. Those children are being at least raised with their parents, uh, except for three percent of them. So uh, around the average around the world, you're not going to get above, you know, the 7 or 6 percentile range on average. Uh, you're going to be in a lower bracket. And so that, that's, that's interesting to me. And, and I don't bring these statistics up to make anyone feel bad or to condemn anybody. I'm not bringing that up for that reason. I bring them up to point out that, that the times that we live in, in this country right now, are, are just unique in the dramatic changes, like over the past 50 years. Um, what, you know, what people were dreaming about 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, what families look like, what their future look like. I mean, they've been drastically changed starting in the 80s, of course, and I've preached on this before. I grew up through some of that. I wasn't of age yet, but I remember how, how no-fault divorce just wrecked so many families in my peer groups. I mean, just, I mean, it was like anything goes when the whistle blows. You used to, some people don't know this, you used to actually have to sue for divorce. Once you got married, you actually had to have a reason to be divorced. You couldn't just roll into the judge and say, irreconcilable differences, you know, whatever, you know, we're out. You had to actually have a reason. So, you know, you had to be pretty serious to get in because it wasn't so easy to get out. So that was the standard in the United States for many, many, many generations. And then in the 80s, um, a, a law that came out of California, surprise, surprise, um, which is actually ratified, one of the greatest mistakes Ronald Reagan uh, ever made in his life, he, he, he claimed that, he owned it, was allowing no-fault divorce in California. Of course, he's an actor, you know, that's how they roll. And uh, that thing rolled out in the 80s across the United States, and then divorce was just rampant across the United States. And it still is to this day. As a matter of fact, I think many people have just given up on marriage. They've just given up on it. Why even get married? It's just a piece of paper. And we've lost our way. We don't even understand who ordains marriage. We don't even understand what marriage is about or what it's for or what it pictures or what, you know. So those are, those are dramatically different changes, right? And you can imagine the heartbreak over the, the generations. Maybe some of you in this room, you, you imagine something as a youth. You had some image of what what was intended, or at that time, that was, that was socially the way it went, and then all of a sudden, things changed, right? Sin entered in. Things happened. It didn't go the way you wanted, and you have unmet expectations. You have surprises. Things blow up, and your dream marriage is no longer what you thought it was going to be. Man, that's exactly, I think, probably how Hannah felt. I mean, I don't think she probably married Elkanah thinking, you know what? I'm going to spend many years with another woman in my house, and my husband sharing her bed and her having lots of children and me having none. I just dreamed about that since I was a little girl. I don't think so. I think, I think you can imagine that that's just, oh, that'd be heavy. It'd be a heavy load. So what she do? She just runs? No, she doesn't have that option. She quits? She doesn't have that option. She's kind of stuck in a very bad situation. Elkanah was the love of her life, I suppose, I suspect. And I'm sure that she dreamed of fulfilling her role as a fruitful wife, as most young brides would. But I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us any of those details. It just leaves us with the circumstances that we find Hannah in. Whatever the case, I'm pretty sure that her dreams and her vision for what was going to happen, what God was going to do in her life, did not and were not being fulfilled, at least at this time we meet her in 1 Samuel. And why is that? And why did God take her and pull her out of all the people of the Bible to share this story? I'm glad you asked. You're asking a really good question. Um, <clears throat> because, well, listen, Israel isn't living up to what God intended. 
You know, God had intended Israel to, to, to enter the land and, and to, to follow him and, 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 to, and to drive out the enemies and the enemies that were left. He intended for them to continue to administrate their government in a theocracy there and to continue to expand the kingdom and teach different generations war and to, to, to continue to bring to pass the, the fulfillment of the prophecies that he had given to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses and the law of Moses, all of that was something that God blessed them with and, and he gave them the system of sacrifice and worship and, and all of those things. And, and yet, you know what? They were fruitless. They just weren't bearing fruit. I mean, it's almost like God gave them a, a, a Bible, like a Bible they could depend upon, that they could have absolute certainty of, a, a Bible that they could execute on, a Bible that gave them clear instructions, clear definitions, clear marching orders. And yet they just... They were impotent to, to execute on it. They, they couldn't grasp hold of God's power. They couldn't get a hold of, of what God was wanting them to do because there was lacking some obedience. Enter Hannah. Enter Ruth. Enter the obscure people of the Bible who despite what was going on at the temple, despite what Hophni and Phinehas were doing at the temple, despite uh, Eli, despite all the things that were going on, you know, despite her being accused of being drunk, she didn't quit going to church. She, she, she went back because she was serious about worshiping the Lord. She was serious about following God. Even when her expectations were shattered, she followed God. And you know what? That's what most mothers do. It's not the dream that they grew up thinking about, but it's hard. But you know what? They, those that follow God find that God is faithful. It does appear, by the way, that Elkanah was faithful to worship the Lord. The first mention of the Lord of hosts is mentioned in verse 3. The Lord of hosts refers to the Lord of the armies of heaven, often called the heavenly host. And since the time of Enoch, we see that the Lord has always anticipated returning with ten thousands of his saints. According to Enoch, if you look back in Jude, verse 14. The phrase Lord of hosts is used 245 times in the Old Testament. And it hasn't shown up at all in the Old Testament until this passage. That's peculiar, isn't it? No, I don't mean in Cass County. I mean, it's in the Bible, it's peculiar. I, it's, it's very peculiar. I wonder why that is. Could it be that God is, is doing something? He's, he's getting ready to establish a king and a kingdom on the planet that would represent him the way that he intended? Quite possibly. By the way, in the New Testament, you don't find that phrase. Because it's spiritual. Hannah's barren womb is a picture of Israel's fruitlessness and their barrenness in the inhabitation of the promised land. God and his mighty promises just were not being fulfilled. Nonetheless, God had had this troubled wife in a fruitless marriage to bring change to a nation and the world. Throughout the scripture, God used circumstances that seem impossible around a barren womb to produce supernatural results. I don't have time to go through all of them, but you know many of them. Sarah, Rebecca, right? Rachel, you can go through the New Testament and, and see some as well. So the other, things, the other thing that is evident in the first three verses is that deliverance will once again come out of obscurity. Just as in the previous book of Ruth, it ends with the lineage of David through the line of Ruth and Boaz, so that, that mission-critical uh, king can come forth. So God brings this prophet and this priest Samuel from obscurity. You know, Isaiah 55, 8 tells us that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither is his ways our ways, saith the Lord. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sometimes we think we're smarter than God. Sometimes we think we can outmaneuver Him, but we cannot. There are times, like in Hannah's case, she couldn't get around it. She was stuck. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and, the, and God hath chosen the, uh, the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know what God's looking for? He's looking for a place to get glory. 
Uh, if you read ahead in 1 Samuel, you'll see you can't get that done in the, in the temple because Hophni and Phinehas are, are just messing it all up. Despite these good-hearted people like Elkanah, who obviously gives liberally to the Lord and gives obediently to the Lord and, and in a sense, religiously to the Lord. He's, ma- he's lacking some things. I'll get to that in a minute. But he has some good things going on in his life as well. Even though Hannah was a favored wife with a troubled life, she never grew bitter or angry with God. If she did, we're not told that she was. When we see her here, we see she is still faithful and goes to the only man that can really help her. And it wasn't her husband. It was the Lord. I don't want to get an amen. But how many wives could tell you, yep, He's the, Jesus is the only man you can ultimately depend upon. That is true. If you go into, now, you should always depend upon your husband. Of course, he should come through for you. But you know what? Men are going to fail. And wives are going to fail. In a marital relationship, who are you going to really depend upon? It's going to be the Lord. Right? That's, what's gonna, that's, what, that's the grace that you need to be married, to have that picture of Christ in the church. Of course, they don't know about that in the Old Testament yet because that's not been revealed. But, but Hannah, man, she was faithful. Hannah could have blamed God for her barren womb. I mean, as a matter of fact, he's the one that shut it up. She could have grown bitter because the fruit of the, the womb is his reward and she's not being rewarded. And man, how much do I got to put up with? I mean, my adversary has beat me up. She certainly was feeling the pressure. But she didn't accuse God. Like Job, who lost everything. Yea, though he slay me, right? Yet will I serve him. So Hannah could have, have grown bitter and distant. You know what she could have done? She could have just turned to the fertility goddess. You know, whichever one was popular at the time, Ashtaroth, Isis, whichever version of that was available, that's what Israel was doing. There's a lot of people in Israel that started worshiping under different trees and, and, and offering a pagan uh, sacrifices to the, to the God of the earth to bring forth fertility in the womb. And, and beloved, I, I've been in situations even today, back when Amy and I were younger, and I had people suggest that, you know, you need to go here and you need to go touch this statue. And we're told that if you do, then this will happen and that'll happen. And you know what that is? That's old-fashioned paganism. It's still prevalent today. People still giving that kind of counsel. No, the, the fruit of the womb is the Lord's reward. He opens and he shuts the womb. Now, I know about all the medical stuff, but God supersedes all that. Hannah could have blamed God for her barren womb, but she didn't. She could have went to pagan methods. She could have left off uh, what the Bible says, and she could have went to some other, uh, some other god, small g, to try to find some other help, some other witch doctor, so to speak, to help her. But she didn't do that. Instead, Hannah was faithful in her worship to the Lord of hosts, which brings me to my second point. She was faithful to her husband. She's faithful to the Lord. Point two, Hannah gave her burden to the Lord in prayer. Oh, and what a burden it was. In verses 4 through 7, we, we see in the text there, it says, And when the, the time was that El, uh, Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters. So there's, there's multiple sons, multiple daughters. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary was pro- provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did, so year by year, when she shut up the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. See, Hannah endured a, this for a long time. I don't really know how many children Penina had, but Elkanah's provision became the fuel for derision. Right, that, that you know, here this this uh, his wife has all these children, sons and daughters, and of course he's providing. Well, he's a provider, by the way. I, I I give him credit. That's what all the men should do. We should provide, right? So he's providing, and since he's a provider and he's given all this food out for his family, he's like, hey, I'm going to give a worthy portion to Hannah, more than she needs, because I love her. The problem is she doesn't need it, because she's only one person. That just kind of like salt. <laughs> In the womb, I'm sure. I can imagine what Penina was saying. Hey, can I have some of that? Because you can't use it. 
You can imagine some of the things that were going on. You know, women can be mean. They really can be. I'm saying, I'm just, I had two older sisters, man. I saw some fights back in the day. One time I'm in my room and it's like, bang, clang, bang, boom, boom. Next thing you know, the, the, the doorbell thing falls off the wall and hits the floor. And I'm like, wow, you know. Uh, and my oldest sister is 10 years older than me, man. I did not want to get between her and anything. She could have whooped me. She probably still could whip me if you know my sister Carrie. She is a, she's a firecracker. That has nothing to do with the message. But anyway, <laughs> women can be mean. I can, I'm a, I can testify to that. By the way, I, it wasn't until I was five years old. My used, uh, middle sister, sorry I'm telling my family. Um, I don't think she's watching. So she used to just torment me. I mean like, like, like till I was in a blind rage. And so, uh, but you know what? I got to a certain height. You know, when I was getting ready to be taken up to the temple and I was weaned. No, I'm just kidding. And so... I got to a certain height, and uh, when I would swing, I started connecting with her kidneys. <laughs> now, I actually don't remember that. She's the one that told me that. She's like, yeah, once you start hitting me in those kidneys, I quit. <laughs> She's like, so I was like, oh, praise the Lord. I do remember being a blind rage and swinging, but I don't remember connecting with anything. <laughs> anyway, I'm just saying women can be mean. I'm just telling you. You think, oh, you grew up in a... You had two older sisters. You're not very tough. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, a little fun. A little honey lets the medicine go down, doesn't it? Elkanah's provision really did become the fuel for the derision. And, you know, it, they had... A, it, I was thinking about this. If they had four children, and I don't think they... I don't know. They had sons and daughters, so they had at least four children. Right? So then they had... I don't know when they conceived, but let's just say they conceived the first year. It takes nine months, right? Forty weeks to have the first one. So let's just throw five years out there at the minimum. If there was any space between the kids, if there was more than four, you're going out further. If these were all conceived in the house with her and it's not some sort of situation where he's bringing them in through a, 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 a situation through the law of the kinsman redeemer and they're all conceived by him, I mean, that's five years minimum that she's enduring this. Maybe longer. We don't know. We're not given those details. But we certainly know that in all of this, it's, it's a burden. It's a heavy burden. And it grew heavier and heavier as the days gone on. And as Elkanah tried to help her, help her, I'm sure it really didn't help. So when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 7, the, the text reminds us that this went on year after year as Elkanah made his trek up to worship and Hannah was at war with her adversary. Man, how many mothers know what that's about? Every Sunday you get up to try to go to worship, man, and there's a battle. You try to get to church, you try to get to the house of God, and there's a battle. It's not, it's, hopefully it's not coming from a concubine or a wife that's living with your husband. That would be a mess. But, I mean, it's something else, right? You know, the toast gets burnt, the kids are screaming, uh, the, the shirt got snagged. That was our deal this morning. My, my, one, the shirt I was going to wear had a big snag in it, so... Amy's like, don't melt down. She takes care of me. Wear that shirt. Okay. There's always something, right? You're, there's always something that's, that, that, that is, is hindering your worship. There's always something to try to get in the way. But you know what? Hannah didn't allow that to stop her from drawing close to God. You know, I, I've, told, I've told moms before, you know, I don't know. Sometimes you just got to go to the bathroom, right? Shut the door and get with Jesus. Because when those, when those little dudes are little, man, there's like no relief. I don't mean abandon your kids. Please make sure they're cared. Put them in the little cradle thing or whatever, the little playpen. But you got to find time to get with God. Elkanah's provision is nice, but it doesn't suffice. And he's trying. Let's give him a little credit. He's trying. He's doing what he knows to do. He's bringing stuff. He's trying to help her. He gives her a worthy portion. But the Bible says she's not hungry. Penina had taken her appetite. I mean, she was grieved. Thanks for the food, man, but I don't even have an appetite. I don't want to eat. Besides that, if I eat, I'm going to fatten up, and then Penina will make more fun of me then. Right? So she's, a, she's in a lose-lose situation. She's just grieved. She's heavy. She's losing her appetite, man. She just doesn't... His, his sacrifice is nice, but it's not going to suffice. 
She needs more. But I will tell you, husbands, there is a huge learning point right here in verse 8 for all of us men and sons. <laughs> in verse 8, he tries to offer some consolation. It's probably the worst, worst thing I've seen a man say to his wife in a long time. <laughs> then said El- Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? You know, what, what's your problem, honey? What's wrong? Why are you crying? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to you? Am I not better to you? Than ten, I did look at that, ten sons. Am I not better to you than ten sons? It's like, dude, shut up. <laughs> you know the answer to that? No! You're not better to me than ten sons. My womb is still barren. No, Penina is not going to stop because I love you. She'll hate me more. No, no, no. You know what he should have said? Hannah, listen. I know this is painful. But you, you, you are better than ten sons. Now, I don't know the backstory. I wish I knew a little bit more because I don't. God doesn't want me to know. But I, so it leads me to imagine. Perhaps he'd already proven by marrying another wife that she wasn't better to him than ten sons. I don't know. I don't know. We're not given those details. So what's he, gonna, what's he really saying? I love me, Hannah. And, you know, because I love me, man, or woman, you should love me too. Because I'm better than anything else you're going to get. Oh, that's a nice ointment. That'll, that'll, that'll soothe. You know what's really, really awesome about this conversation? You don't hear one dish break. <laughs> you, you, you don't hear anybody's, you know, you don't see a spike get driven through his head like Cicero. I mean, you just, it's just it, radio silence. But you know the next thing you see Hannah doing? Where's she going? She's going to a man who understands. And that's the Lord. She goes to someone who gets it. Which, but there's some good things about Elkanah. I like his provision. I like his, he is faithful to go up and worship. He's, he's all about providing like most men are. But like most men, we miss the mark, don't we? And all the women said, Amen. First, he knows why she's weeping. He knows it. He knows why she's not hungry. He knows why she's grieving. She's lost a dream, and she can't get it back. He's not better than ten sons. So Hannah chose to cast all her care on the Lord because she knew that he cared for her. In verses 9 through 18, I'm not going to read through that for time's sake, but Hannah wisely took her petition to the only one that could help with the needs of her heart. And here we see Hannah makes this Nazarite vow to the Lord, and she does it for all the days of his life in verses 10 through 11. And this is total and complete offering. And she goes all in. She takes all her chips and puts it on the table and slides them over to the Lord and says, Look, Lord, this is the deal. I know you're a giving God, and I'm a giving gal. And so I'm going to give whatever you give me. You give me a son, I'm going to give him back. Not just a little bit. I'm not a Nazarite vow. You didn't have to do it all the days of his life. She could have specified for 20 years, 30 years. She, there's actually, uh, you could be a Nazarite is not just a man. You could be a man or a female with a Nazarite vow, and it's a set time and all of that. She goes like all in. She goes crazy. She's like, hey, I'm all in. Here's all my chips. God's like, I'll call that. And then he goes all in and gives her a son. All the days, all the days of his life, she's given him to the Lord. Now, this is all just in her prayer. It was a vow that she made. And by the way, it's a vow that, according to Numbers chapter 30, could have been rescinded by Elkanah. The husband uh, could rescind the vow, or if you were a single lady under the care of your father, your father could rescind the vow. So if a lady makes a vow that the husband or the father seemed foolish, then he could rescind that vow. But Elkanah did not, as we know. And by the way, that blessed the nation of Israel. So, 
Uh, Samuel will be the one of three notable Nazarites mentioned in the scripture. The first was Samson in Judges 13. The second is Samuel here in 1 Samuel, of course. And the third is who? That's right, John the Baptist. Those are the big three, and the only three that are really mentioned of note in your Bible. They're all important in, in doing what? Bringing in the kingdom. Bringing in the kingdom. And so, uh, this, is going to be, this son is going to be important to righting all the wrongs that are going on in Israel. Would to God Elkanah would have uh, led Hannah to the altar and, and poured out his soul with her. That he'd have said, honey, I know that, that I'm, not worth, I'm not better to you than ten sons. I know that this is nothing that I can do to help you. Let us both go to the altar. Let us both pour our hearts out. Let me lead you to the one who can. But he didn't do that. As he stepped out, though, the Lord stepped in. Because Hannah stepped up and went and prayed on her own. And we see here that we can pray without uttering words of the Lord. There's a lesson right there in verses 12 through 16. And Eli looks and sees her lips moving and sees her, thinks she's drunken and just kind of mumbling. And she's like, oh, no, 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 my Lord. No, not at all. I'm pouring my heart out to the Lord. And she says, remember me and, forget not, and not forget thine handmaid. Remember me. It's an important phrase in the scripture. Samson was the first to say it in Judges 16:28. As he was at that critical point, and he'd, he'd wasted pretty much all his opportunities, and he's now a slave, and he finally musters up the, the wisdom to say, Lord, remember me. And what happened? God remembered him and what his purpose was on the earth, and he pulled down those pillars, which, by the way, archaeologists have found that location a few years ago. And he pulled the house down and killed all those Philistines. He killed more in his death than he did in his life, and he killed quite a few in his life. God remembered him. If you go through the Bible and look at that, it's an important phrase. There's a passage in Luke 23, 42 through 30. There's a thief on a cross. You know what he says to Jesus? Remember me. And, God, and Jesus says, I will. I'll see you in paradise, pal. He didn't even get baptized. He just believed on the Lord. God did remember Hannah. And the blessings started flowing. Eli blesses her and, and uh, intercedes for her. And he prays for her. And, and he says in verse 18, And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was, was more sad. Eli said, Hey, may God bless you and your womb. You can go back and read it. We've already read over it. And she goes away, and her, her burden is gone. She brought it to the Lord, and she left it at the altar, and she walked away. And man, she had not had a child yet, but she was as if she had, because the Lord was her strength. And her countenance, she's hungry. She's ready to go to dinner. She's not worried about Pen and I anymore. She's just rolling forward in the grace of God because grace is really the meaning of Hannah's name. But it's been years since anyone could see that grace on her face. She's been downtrodden. Her countenance, she's probably losing weight, starting to see her bones. People are probably talking about her. Man, Hannah's not looking good. She's looking sickly. I don't know. These are things I could imagine. All of a sudden, man, it's turned around. Why? Because she met with the Lord. Hey, moms, when your dreams are shattered and everything's going wrong and the kids aren't coming up the way you imagined and, and the husband's not treating you the way they should and things are not exactly the way you dreamed them to be, don't forget to go to the Lord in your weakness, right? Because he'll be your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah. Don't be too sad. Get glad because the Lord, man, he wants your heart. At this point, her womb is, is still barren. Penaniah is still her adversary, and those circumstances have not changed. But by faith, she knows that God's going to work in her, her life. May we all remember our sufficiency is of the Lord and not ourselves. That's going to give us peace that passes understanding. You know, First Peter says this. First Peter chapter 5, Peter, who himself was disappointed, right? He was a guy one time that was disappointed in the Lord Jesus Christ himself because Jesus was going to the cross and he didn't want him to. And he got all out of swords, started cussing like a sailor, that he was, and ended up just, just, just denying Jesus. Jesus gets him back, gets him straightened out, changes his identity from a, a you know, tells him, look, man, you're going to be a sheep herder from here on out. You're not a fisherman. Quit acting like one, quit talking like one. You're repping me. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. You know the story. And years later, he writes. He writes in, in, in uh, 1 Peter 5. He says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And do what Hannah did. 
Casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. Boy, you know, a fisherman like, like Peter could get a hold of casting because he used to cast those nets to, ca to catch fish. He knew what he was saying there. He's like, take all the care, all the burden, all the weight, all that you have, all that you can muster, bring it to the altar, cast all your care on him. Why? Because he careth for you. Man, has the world, the flesh, the devil, the adversary lied to you? Has he told you that God doesn't care? Has he told you that God doesn't care about your condition? He doesn't care about your, your womb. He doesn't care about your cancer. He doesn't care about your grief. He doesn't care about your circumstances. He doesn't, doesn't, doesn't. Listen, that's a lie. God already cared 2,000 years ago on the cross. He has died on the cross to show how much he cares for us. And he calls us, not only in salvation, but even daily in our sanctification, to cast our care upon him, believing by faith that he cares for us when things around us say he doesn't. That is called walking by faith, not by sight. And beloved, that is what took a nation that had everyone doing that which was right in their own eyes and turned them around because there were women there were women, they became faithful mothers who believed God when their circumstances said no. They went ahead and said, yes, I'm following you back from Moab. I'm following you to Bethlehem. I'm following you uh, even when I, my womb is empty. I'm following you faithfully. Even when I don't know what's going to happen, I'm going to believe you, Lord, and I'm going to walk out of here knowing I cast it on you. If you don't bring your chips, that's not on me because my heart was right. And it was, she had it all laid out there. She cast all her care upon the Lord. So Hannah, she, she gave her life to her as a wife. She, man, she, she gave her heart in prayer. And Hannah gave her, her firstborn son to the Lord all the days of his life. The Lord remembered Hannah, and she conceived in verses 19 through 20. In this instance, the Lord remembering Hannah brought fruit to the womb, not victory over the tomb. Right? She's still going to die, and she's still got to wait for the Messiah and all of those other prophecies to come. But when Elkanah knew his wife this time, the Lord opened the womb, and she conceived and brought forth the first of three sons and two daughters, according to 1 Samuel 2.21. And Samuel would, would be his name, means asked of God. When she asked, God heard. She asked, and the Lord heard her. Hannah stayed back and nurtured Samuel as she prepared to fulfill her vow in verses 21 through 23, Hannah stayed home until Samuel was weaned. We read the text. You know, there's something to be said about staying home and raising the kids. I'm not going to make that a hobby horse. But nurturing the children today, I just will say, it is important. Don't sublet that out to people that don't love Jesus. As a matter of fact, they're not, no one's going to love your child like you will. Hannah was not going to let go of Samuel until he was weaned from the milk. And beloved, there's a spiritual picture there for those of us in a discipleship-making church, man or woman. When God brings fruit to this church, people get saved. People get plugged in like Bill and Regina over here. You know what? Our job is to nurture them in the Word of God. Our job is to help them grow till they can open this book, rightly divide it themselves, and start feeding other people. That's what discipleship's all about. We are here to, to, to make sure people get grown up in the Lord. That's what our discipleship process is all about. It's not ours. It's what Jesus Christ did with his disciples. He spent three and a half years walking with them, talking with them, showing them illustrations, working out their issues, letting them fall, helping them back up, and then he left them. He didn't abandon them. He left them so that they could fulfill what he didn't. Go beyond the regions that he preached. Go further than he ever did. He did that because... His mission was their mission. He was preparing them the whole time to fulfill his mission, just as he is us to this day. You know, I'm here today because a man not only led me to Christ, but after he led me to Christ, he fed me in Christ. He led me to Christ at, at, at a public school, and then he invited me to his house at a dinner table. But instead of opening up food, well, we did have some cool snacks, but instead of just opening up food, we opened up the Bible. And that Bible was sweeter than any M&M I put in my mouth, man. That sweet honeycomb of the Word of God, it did the trick. Taking a person who, who was anti-Christ for the most part, saving my soul, getting me into the Bible, and getting me going in God's direction. Someone who's like, I will never be part of a Baptist church. Now I am preaching in a Baptist church. I mean, you talk about total turnaround. God did it. 
through the word of God, through someone weaning us and bringing us up. So Elkanah was, a support, was, a, was supportive of, of Hannah and did not rescind her vow. I thought about that. He could have taken that son on for himself, but he chose not to. And he even encouraged her. He says, hey, listen, you made a vow to the Lord, Hannah. Don't go back on it. You know what? She was faithful not to. Can you imagine what it was like to take that now a young child weaned from the, from the breast and give that child to Eli? When I'm sure the reputation of Hophni and Phinehas seemed to already be well established? You know who Hannah was trusting? It wasn't Eli. She's trusting the Lord. She's trusting the Lord with her child. And beloved, no matter what kind of parent you think you are, or how good you think you are, and how much you love your kids, let me tell you something. Your kids will not be successful unless you trust the Lord. I've seen some of the biggest train wrecks, and some of the biggest heartbreaks happen in Christian homes. Why? Because somehow parents think there's some magical formula. If I do all of these things just right, and I do all of this just right, then my kids are going to be just right. No, God created Adam in the garden, and he fell. And God did it just right. Beloved, it's the Lord. Who keeps the house? Who keeps our foot from slipping? It's the Lord. Beloved, we've got to be at the altar ourselves praying. We've got to be serious about this from the day of their birth till the day of their death. I bet my mom is still praying for me. I bet my Aunt Joyce is still praying for me. There's people in my life I know that prayed for me, and that's probably how I got saved. I think about that. Who was praying for me? How did I get saved? Because I don't think I mustered all that up on my own. Praying mamas. Mrs. Lee, it's so good to see you. I didn't know you were here today. That's awesome. So it's so good to have some of these moms here. I saw Betty Cundiff, too. I hadn't seen her. I've been, I think her ears were burning. I talk about Walt, and the next thing you know, here's Betty. So praise the Lord. So that's awesome. We love you guys. There's women in the church that are kind of like mothers to all of us, isn't there? It's awesome. See Dorothy back there? She's the youngest among us. So, uh, 93. You know, in a giving household, Hannah gave it all. I mean, this was a giving household. Elkanah was a giver. Hannah was a giver. But not one of them could outgive God. What a blessed conclusion. Now, if you go on to read, and I don't have time to get into the next chapters, but you know what happens. She brings a little coat for him. She's taking care of him. And she didn't just drop him off and leave, man. She's, ta- she's checking up on him as they come up to Shiloh there. She's taking care of him. And you know what? Before he even knows what to do, the Bible attributes that he is a worshiper. Where did he learn that? Before he knew the Lord, right? He got that vision. He didn't know the Lord, the Bible says yet. There's no open vision, and he's getting a vision later on. He doesn't know the Lord, but you know what? The Bible says he's ministering to the Lord, and he's worshiping the Lord. How did he learn to do that? We know how he did. Is his mama. And, of course, Eli helped along the way. She gives Samuel up for... She lends him, she says, to the Lord all the days of his life. A total sacrifice. You know what? I love that lens. Lens. Not lens, but lens. Like a banker lends you money. Who gave her that boy? Well, God did. He was God's boy from the beginning because he's the one that blessed the womb. But she lends to God what God gave her. You know why? Because she knows she can trust the Lord to give back what she lends to him. Man, God's faithful. You know the hardest thing for a mom to do? is that, you know, we call the empty nest, right? When I mean, you got to let go. Let go of those children and let them go. Beloved, it's not just about raising them. It's about sending them. The Bible is very clear in Psalm 127. What are those children for? To meet the enemies at the gate. Those kids are here for a reason, and that purpose goes well beyond you. They're there to, they're there to be in your stead. They're there to be in a position, position of authority to speak with the enemies at the gate. They're there to, to eventually, they're going to be doing the mission when you can't. There has to be, they're like an arrow in the hands of a mighty man. They're meant to be launched. Man, Hannah launched hers early. And God kept that arrow true all the way through the Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, Samuel's like, I'm done, guys. It's time for my retirement. 
you know? You got Saul, you got your king, you got what you want. Call me if you need me. I haven't done anything wrong to y'all. Amen? They're like, amen. I'm out of here. See you later, alligator. It's not till chapter 25 that he's dead. He's still showing up and correcting and getting Saul, trying to get Saul back on track. You know what? That guy never quit. He never retired. He ran it out to the very end. His whole life was about serving the Lord because she lent him to the Lord his entire life. Beloved, that's a big gift. You know why she could give that gift? It changed a nation because she was full of grace. And moms, I just want you to be, I just want to thank you for being full of grace. Because ultimately it's the grace of the Lord that gives you fruit. It's the grace of the Lord that rears your fruit. And it's the grace of the Lord that sends the fruit. And by, by God's grace in some of the most obscure places, some of the most uh, out of the way situations, some of the most difficult circumstances will come forth people and children that God uses for his honor and glory. And the devil couldn't have mapped it out if he tried to. Because it was all in God's providence. And he worked through moms, faithful women like Hannah and Ruth and moms like you. And if you're not a faithful mom, I don't take that back. I challenge you this morning to get a hold of who Jesus Christ is. Get plugged into, if not this church, another church that teaches and preaches the word of God. That can disciple you and get you in a position of faith. Where you can walk by faith, not by sight. Where you're not so distracted by all the noise. And you can run with purpose the race that's given to you. Whether you're old or young, it doesn't matter. God has a purpose for reproducing fruit. And it's not just physical. It is spiritual. It's called leading people to Christ and making disciples. And that's what we're here to do. Let's stand together in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together this morning. We pray a blessing on the reading and the hearing of your word. Lord, it's been a morning of celebration. Hannah means grace, and out of obscurity comes the grace of a giving mother who, whose love for God has changed the course of history. Out of a hopeless and hurtful situation came a song of victory in chapter 2, Lord. And Lord, it is a great, it's a great passage, extolling your vir- virtue, extolling your power, extolling uh, all the things that you are, and you will yet be to all of us even today. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for, for moms. We're thankful for the grace of God that's been bestowed upon those that nurture and serve faithfully in difficulty and obscurity. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the fruit of the womb, but we're also thankful for the fruit of the gospel that does overcome the tomb. And Lord, I pray this Mother's Day that you would bless the preaching and the hearing of the Word of God. If your mother is here or your wife is here, grab her hand right now. Grab her hand and let's pray for her. Heavenly Father, we pray for our mothers We pray for our wives. Lord, we pray for our daughters. Lord, we live in a world that's increasingly hostile toward them and their call. And Lord, I just want to pray over them right now. Lord, I pray, God, your protective hand upon them. I pray, God, for uh, the men in their life, whether it be their sons, their husbands, their fathers. Lord, that you would give them a giving heart, that you would give them a sensitive heart, that they would uh, put you ahead of themselves, that they would understand their role so that these women can fulfill their role. Heavenly Father, thank you for these that are here today. Lord, thank you for those that aren't here today that we know and we love. Lord, we pray a blessing upon the reading and the hearing of your word. We pray a blessing of fruitfulness on the lives of each and every saint in the room. Lord, that you would make us all fruitful, that we would multiply, that we'd reproduce. And Lord, I pray, God, that we would be like Hannah, if we're in a dry season in our life and we haven't seen fruit, Lord, may we throw ourselves on the altar. May we reconsecrate ourselves once more and say, God, I will go all in so that we can see, I can see you have fruit in my life, Lord. May we set aside all the things that weigh us down, Lord, all the things that bog us down. May we uh, get all the noise out of our life and focus once again upon you and your word and your will. Oh, thankful. We're so thankful, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you for blessing us with fruit. Thank you for for what it means to have fruit. Help us to nurture that fruit and bring it up in the admonition of the Lord. And Lord, may that fruit change the course of history. Oh, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, and, and we praise you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare to dismiss this morning, if you came and you don't know the Lord Jesus as Savior, 
uh, please grab someone that, know, that you may have come with or grab me in the foyer afterward. And we would love to introduce you to Jesus in a personal way. We could take the Bible and open it up and share the gospel with you this morning. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up, though, because we have children's workers that need to be released. So let's go ahead and prepare to give back to the Lord. And as we do that, uh, I want to thank you for coming. Once again, if you're a guest, if you could drop the guest card, uh, in, or if you didn't get a guest card, you can rip off the paper on the side of the bulletin. Drop that in the offering plate as it goes by. That'd be a great gift to us this morning. We'd love to get back with you and encourage you in the Lord. And so let's have a word of prayer, and then we will take up the offering. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to give back to you. We pray a blessing on the reading, the hearing, and the living of the Word of God today. We thank you for uh, how you loved us and gave your Son as a sacrifice for our sin. While we were yet sinners, uh, Lord, you gave for us, and we're so thankful for that. We're thankful for that grace that is now ushered in an age of grace and given us the Word of grace, the ministry, and the Word, uh, Lord, of reconciliation. We pray, God, a blessing upon our calling and our mission and Lord, I pray, God, that you would just encourage us in our hearts today, man, woman, child, it doesn't matter. Lord, we pray, God, that we would be in your perfect will. And we thank you for the privilege of giving back to you. We pray, God, that we would be gracious in our giving as Hannah and Elkanah and you are, Lord, in your giving. We praise you and we thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. That was a good message, amen? What a great message about mothers. Um, I remember when I was uh, rebellious, my mom was praying for me, and that's why you know, I'm here today. So, thankful for mothers, for sure. Um, go all in uh, for the Lord, because he is faithful. Cast your care upon him, and he will show himself faithful. So that's a good word. Uh, real quick, because I know I'm in the way of a Mother's Day lunch and don't want to make a bunch of mothers mad. So real quickly, uh, there is a London prayer team right after service in the library today. So if you're not a part of a prayer team, great way to invest in what God's doing around the world. Uh, Brady Barnes uh, is leading that. Uh, there is next uh, on the, actually May 16th, there will be a VBS uh, decor work time from 10 a.m. to 3. And on May 20th, there is a men's breakfast, uh, the Man Up uh, Breakfast. So that's at 8.30. And then on May 21st, there's a UGRO parent and student meeting. So that will be Luke Fleshman, if you have questions about that, during the 9 a.m. hour. And he'll be presenting information about um, high school and middle school as, as kids uh, transition up into those, those areas. Last, we're having a Taking It to the Streets on May 28th, and that will be getting ready for Church in the Park that will be on June 4th. If you have questions about that, you can see Pat Lee for more information. So with that, we'll pray and dismiss. Heavenly Father, we, Lord, we thank you for your word, your truth, and the fact that you are so faithful. When we fail you, Lord, when those are